What if everything you believe is a lie? What if the ground beneath your feet, the sky above your head, and even your own memories could all be illusions? 400 years ago, one man dared to ask that question, and in doing so, rewrote the rules of thought, science, and reality itself. His name was René Descartes, soldier, mathematician, philosopher, rebel. I think, therefore I am. This is the story of the man who doubted the world and in the process changed it forever. Before you go, we've just launched our brand new channel and our very first video is now live. It's the beginning of an exciting journey and we'd love for you to be part of it. A genius code breaker. A locked bag. And a death no one can explain. Was it an accident? Or an assassination? The spy who died twice, Gareth William. March 31st, 1596. A child is born in the quiet town of La Haye en Touraine, France. His name, René Descartes. Sickly from the start, no one knows if he will survive the winter. But his mother dies within a year, leaving him in the care of his grandmother. That fragile body hides a restless mind already forming. At age 11, René is sent to La Fleche, one of the most rigorous schools in Europe. Here he studies Latin, logic and philosophy, guided by Jesuit priests. His health earns him special permission to stay in bed late each morning, a habit he will keep for life. Mornings in bed become his private thinking hours. The boy's true passion is not in theology or rhetoric, but in mathematics. Numbers seem pure, untouchable by doubt. He puzzles over shapes and patterns, sensing that somewhere in them lies a key to certainty, something no opinion could shake. But the more he learns, the less satisfied he feels. So much of what passes for truth is based on authority, not proof. Why should ancient words decide what is real? Young Descartes begins to doubt, quietly, but deeply. By 1616, he earns a law degree at Poitiers, but the world of dusty courtrooms holds no appeal. Instead, he sets off traveling through France, across the Low Countries, seeking experience beyond books. In 1618, he joins the Dutch army under Prince Maurice of Nassau, not from love of war, but to learn engineering, fortification, and the sciences soldiers need. The army becomes his moving classroom. The winter of 1619 is bitter. Far from home, he spends long days alone, thinking about how to find unshakable truths, the noise of battle preparations fades outside his window. Inside, his mind turns inward. Then, the dream. In a rush of strange images, he feels a force telling him that mathematics and reason will be his compass. When he wakes, the decision is made. He will search for a single method to uncover certain knowledge and build the world anew. In 1628, René Descartes makes the Dutch Republic his home. Its cities are safe for thinkers, its printing press is busy, and its government tolerant of unorthodox ideas. Here, he can work in private, away from the reach of church censors and political unrest. But freedom alone isn't enough. Descartes needs a plan. He imagines clearing away all uncertain beliefs, like tearing down a shaky building. Anything that can be doubted will be doubted, 
until only what is certain remains. And there it is. One truth survives his doubt. Even if he doubts everything else, he cannot doubt that he is thinking. And if he thinks, he must exist. I think, therefore I am. It becomes the foundation stone of his new philosophy. From that foundation, Descartes decides anything he perceives as clearly and distinctly as the cogito must be true. This will be his test for certainty, a mental lens to separate truth from illusion. But for this lens to work, he must first trust his own mind. And for that, he must prove a perfect, non-deceiving God exists. Using reason alone, he argues that the very idea of perfection could only come from a perfect being. It's bold. And it draws suspicion from both theologians and skeptics. He makes another daring claim. Mind and body are two separate things. The body is a machine, ruled by physical laws. The mind, thinking and free, is something entirely different. It is a clean break from ancient philosophy, and it will ignite centuries of debate. At the same time, René Descartes transforms mathematics itself. In La Géométrie, he shows how algebra can describe geometry, turning curves into equations. This unites two worlds of math into one powerful tool scientists will use for centuries. This merging of algebra with geometry creates what we now call the Cartesian coordinate system. It will change mathematics and the way we describe space forever. In 1637, Descartes finally goes public. Discourse on the method, part autobiography, part scientific manifesto, spreads across Europe. It's written not in Latin, but in French, so anyone can read it. Scholars argue, critics attack. But the quiet man from La Haye has just changed the rules of knowledge itself. Descartes' ideas travel fast. From France to the Dutch Republic, scholars are rethinking how to approach science and philosophy the method of doubt, the cogito, the new mathematics. They call it Cartesianism. Some embrace him as a leader of a new age of reason. Mathematicians, scientists and philosophers join the conversation, testing his ideas and pushing them into new directions. For them, Descartes is a lighthouse in the fog of old traditions. But the old guard of scholastic philosophers sees him as a threat. His rejection of Aristotelian ideas, his reliance on mathematics instead of metaphysics, to them, it's dangerous, even heretical. Then comes the Cartesian circle, a charge that Descartes' reasoning is flawed. Critics say he proves God by trusting clear and distinct ideas, but then trusts clear and distinct ideas because God exists the debate turns fierce. Others attack his mind-body dualism. How can something non-physical move a physical body? Descartes points to the pineal gland, but skeptics remain unconvinced. The questions keep multiplying. In physics, Descartes offers a bold picture, a universe made of matter in motion with no empty space. Even the planets move in great whirlpools of subtle matter, some find it thrilling. Others see it as replacing divine will with blind mechanics. Far to the north, Queen Christina of Sweden takes notice. A young, brilliant and unconventional ruler, she admires Descartes's intellect and writes to him directly. She wants him at her court to teach her philosophy. It is an honor few could refuse. Despite warnings about Sweden's bitter winters, Descartes agrees. In 1649, he prepares to leave the quiet life of study for the glitter and dangers of a royal court. In late 1649, René Descartes finally arrives in Stockholm after weeks at sea. The winter air is sharp enough to sting the lungs. 
he is here at the request of Queen Christina, the young and ambitious ruler of Sweden. Descartes hopes this visit will be his final chapter in a life devoted to truth. The Queen demands lessons at five in the morning long before the sun rises. They speak of reason, the nature of the soul, and the foundations of knowledge. Descartes finds her curious, sharp, and impatient for answers. But the hour and the cold push his body to its limits. The Swedish winter is relentless. Descartes has always been frail and the freezing mornings take their toll. In France and the Netherlands, he worked in warmth. Here he shivers constantly. His body struggles to match the strength of his mind. Despite the cold, Descartes writes with determination. His last book, Passions of the Soul, studies the connection between the mind and the body. He explores how emotions guide human behavior, blending science with philosophy. These pages will be his final completed work. In January 1650, illness arrives swiftly. The cold mornings with the Queen, the unending snow, they have broken his health. His chest aches and every breath burns. The court physician suspects pneumonia. The days blur into nights. Descartes can no longer leave his bed. He speaks little, conserving his breath for short visits from friends. Yet in his eyes, there is still the calm of a man who followed reason to the very end. On February 11th, 1650, René Descartes dies in Stockholm. The palace is hushed, the news traveling quietly through the city. The world has lost a mind that reshaped philosophy, mathematics, and science. But his words are already beyond the reach of time. Today, Descartes' influence surrounds us. His coordinate system is the backbone of modern mathematics. His questions about mind and body still challenge scientists and philosophers. And his simple statement, I think, therefore I am, continues to echo through the centuries.